Hope everybody's doing well today. I uh, want to welcome everybody to the Unimpressed podcast. And I'm unimpressed that I didn't meet this guy while I was in New Jersey. Uh, just recently moved from North Caldwell, New Jersey. Mr. Rob Ferretti, car right, entrepreneur. Um, welcome to the show, Rob. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. So what's going on in your world? I mean, I know Jersey's got a few little issues up there right now. Me just leaving there. Has anything gotten better than the, the past six months? You know, it's it's funny. I was just, uh, my trip travel company that I have. It's called Adventure Drives. We were just out doing a private birthday party in Vegas for uh, one of our wealthier customers. And he did a week-long birthday party that went through uh, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and then back into Nevada, into Vegas. And Utah and Arizona were like masks, like, yeah, just if you're not feeling well, don't come in. But like masks are not a thing out there, which coming back to New Jersey, and, and it feels normal. Like you'd think it would take you weeks to get used to not wearing a mask. It takes you about 30 minutes. Yeah. And like I was leaving my hotel room all day without without even having a mask in my pocket or the car. And coming back to New Jersey after that, I was like, hey, why is everybody so paranoid? And then like yeah. even people that started the trip that came out that, that were like super paranoid are now like as soon as they walk out of the Newark airport, they rip their mask off and they're standing in the crowd of people on the curb waiting to get in the car. So uh, that's probably one of the biggest things that, that we're still a little bit, I don't want to say behind, but it feels a lot more normal out West. Uh, than it does here. Well, that's kind of how it feels down here in Charleston. I mean, we will go out. And what's interesting is obviously when you walk into a restaurant, you have to wear the mask walking into the restaurant. But when you get to the bar, you can take the mask off. Or when you're sitting down, you're good. When you're standing (laughs) up, you're not good. And I did the same thing at the airport. They're like, all right, we got a social distance. You got to be six feet away from everybody getting on the plane. But Mm -hmm. then when you're on the plane, you're 30 inches away from everybody. So what's the point if I'm going to be sitting next to these people at like, elbow distance for the next six hours. What the hell does it matter if I'm standing six feet away from them or not on the jet bridge? I don't want to say too many bad things. I'm not going to say too many bad things about New Jersey. I love New Jersey. I had a great great, great time there. Um, But one thing that that did, you start thinking about, all the reason that I was in New Jersey, 20 miles from Midtown, right? I think our driveway was 20 miles from Midtown and is doing the things that makes New York, New York, you know, and you can't, you really can't do all those things now. Do you think that's going to come back in New York? Um, I do. And and when you say things that are making New York, New York, you mean like throwing a wet diaper at somebody's car or? No, 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 I'm just saying, you know, you go in, you smell the air, you go in, you go eat a nice dinner, you know, you walk I mean, the that, streets. That's happening now. Like there, there's indoor dining um, and especially in the suburbs, there's indoor dining that it's supposed to be at 30, 50 percent, whatever it is you walk in and these places are as they were pre-pandemic. Oh, OK. And gotcha. So like it, it's there once you're in a restaurant, it's I think we're separating the people that give a damn and the people that don't. And the people that are going out to eat are the people that don't give a damn. They're happy to go inside if they want to sit outside in a tent they can. Uh, otherwise, the people that are inside are just like, all right, I'm, I'm over it. Let's do it. And uh, they, they're they welcoming the risks. And uh, if they feel good, they go out. If they don't feel good, they're a little bit more conscious about it and they stay home. Now, is there a reason with your business? You're, are you from New Jersey originally? I grew up in New Jersey. Yep. Okay. What town did you grow up in? Uh, I was born in Hackensack Hospital. Grew up in Dumont, New Jersey. Dumont, New Jersey. It's okay. Burton County. So it's about uh, it's 20 minutes from Caldwell. Okay. Nice. Nice. Uh, right off of Route 4. So the Paramus area, in between Paramus and the bridge. So you're from New Jersey and you went to college? You went to college? Uh, I did. I went to uh, Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania for a little bit, then Ramapo in uh, North Jersey up in Mawa. And then I dropped out because it seemed like a good idea. Well, I believe in today's time, it's about people. You don't finish the school thing and you head down this road of life. What uh, pushed you in this direction with what you're doing now? I mean, essentially, I didn't want to work for anybody. Uh, that That's sort of what I learned. And I went to school. I was going pre-law. And then I decided that I didn't want to be a lawyer because I don't like lawyers. And I don't, I don't like the fact that you have to sort of defend people that are guilty. And that sucks. And as a lawyer, your, your job is to make them unguilty. And I'm like, well, what if they are guilty? And I'm <laughs> like, I just don't want to be a part of this system. Uh, so I decided that I would just go the path of like, all right, let me just figure it out. Let me enjoy my early 20s, figure out how to make some money and have a good time. 
And I turned that into businesses. I started making street racing DVDs when I was younger, uh, just because I saw a little bit of a market. There, was, there wasn't much out there, but I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And I'd go street racing with my buddies, start filming it, throw a couple of clips up on the internet. And then I'm like, oh, wow, like people are really responding to these things. Look at all the people that are viewing them. And this mm-hmm. is back before there was like a central hosting site like YouTube. So you just have to find a buddy who's got access to a server, throw it on some company server, and then they get like a $3,000 traffic spike in a couple of hours. And he's like, oh, dude, I had to pull your video down. Um, then I'm like, well, if it could cost people money, I could probably make money doing it. I took one, I went back to college just to take one basic editing class to see uh, what I could turn that into. I made a DVD. I went to the New York auto show, took out a booth, sold it, made like 30 grand in a week. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. And uh, I just, cause at that age, I mean, you're working all year to make 30 grand. So now mm-hmm. if I can do it in 10 days, I'm like, all right, let me just, let me do this. Even if I do this five times a year, it's, it's incrementally better than, than what I'm doing now. And you know, that doesn't last forever, but uh, you ride that wave. And I rode that wave for probably about seven years, uh, made a bunch of DVDs. YouTube came along, but then nobody was monetizing anything, but I would use YouTube to drive traffic to buy DVDs. Um, while I was making DVDs, I could go make a DVD and a, and like part time and, and a couple of months of editing that gave me a lot of free time. I met a buddy who was, uh, or I met a guy at a Ferrari event some at some dude's house who said he wanted to start an exotic car rental company. I was like, that's a terrible idea. You're going to give a Ferrari to a random dude who's got a thousand bucks in his pocket. I'm like, you'll be out of business in a week. And uh, I'm a good problem solver. So once he started the company, uh, we linked up because one of his first customers whacked up the car. He's like, oh, problem is it's going to be down for like three weeks and it can only go to this Ferrari facility. It's 15 grand. And I'm like, dude, that dent in your fender is 15 grand. Come on, come over here. So I brought him to a body shop. He's like, I'll have it done in three days and it'll be uh, whatever, 1500 bucks. And he's like, all right, you're coming with me. So uh, me being the problem solver car guy and him being sort of a businessman uh, who went to MIT, we went tit for tat. We worked very well together and uh, we made a quite the large business and come 2015. uh, So I was doing the rental company and growing the rental company and the DVD series slash YouTube at the same time. Come 2015, we sold the rental company. And uh, that's when I started up the travel company, which is Adventure Drive. So I was like, all right, well, if I'm going to sort of retire here, let's do something fun. Now I get to travel the world and write it off effectively. And uh, part of the end of the DVD series, instead of street racing all the time, we would just go like drive the Alps and travel to Europe and do the Nürburgring and rip down the Autobahn and like do all these amazing things. I'm like, this is a lot of fun. Like I could do this forever. And the fact that we're having fun doing it and I'm good at logistics, I can turn this into a company and whether it makes a ton of money or if it's just a hell of a good time, uh, I'll enjoy it. And we did that and that turned into a company as well. And I'm still doing the rentals. I'm still, now I'm doing all three and and now we're doing private events for some of our big customers, which led me to Las Vegas last week to have a, a phenomenal, probably one of the better birthday party that's ever taken place. I can't imagine it because that was a, that was a hell of a week. There was no shortage of adrenaline and fun and shooting guns out of helicopters, shooting tanks. Like, I mean, you name it. We did it. We had flew helicopters into the Grand Canyon for lunch. We've go-karted. We raced cars on racetracks. We uh, we did painting classes, whiskey tastings. I mean, you name it, we did it. And we had a, a phenomenal time. And what type of guy throws a birthday party like that? Uh, wealthy guys. Now, there, there's, two, <laughs> there's two types of wealthy guys. The ostentatious wealthy guy that wants to go to a club and spend a million dollars on bottle service. And then there's the smarter wealthy guy that doesn't need gold foil on top of his caviar. And we can just go out and have a great time and, and the money goes much further. So we invited his close friends and uh, we rented uh, whatever, like $2 million worth of sports cars. And we just had a, a grand old good time. Let me ask you this. When was that that era of DVDs? It's very interesting to me because I was doing a similar thing with action sports because that was a big boom, right? When those DVDs yeah, it's, came it's out. Oh, six, oh, seven, oh, yep. eight big years. Uh, after that, it started. Now you started looking at Blu-ray and HD DVD and they were duking it out for who was going to reign supreme there. And and then that's when YouTube started blowing up too. And uh, the, the big change that YouTube created was that people now wanted not the quality content, but they wanted it on demand. So mm-hmm. if something happens, they want to see it same day. They don't want to see it in like three months. Oh, was that that event? Like, I don't, don't want to wait three months for the coverage. I want it right now. And I started seeing that with the DVDs that people were becoming less patient that I would make a DVD, release it after a year. And then everyone's like, great, where's the next one? I'm like, what are you talking? 
talking about this. I just, I was about to take a week off and, and not do anything for a week. And you're telling me where's the next one. So I guess it's good that there's a demand there, but uh, the internet has created the insatiable appetite for real time uh, entertainment. Well, that's, that's kind of what happened to us is we were doing these one-offs for Red Bull. Yep. Before Red, before Red Bull was Red Bull. This was back in the day, we were the head production company for Red Bull in 04. Used to work with Dane Heron on the motorcycle side. Okay. Uh, motocross and they'd pay us to, you know, we did Baja Diaries, we did the Endure at Erzberg and all they wanted was the to be aired, you know, that one-off on, you know, NBC or whatever. So as long as they got the TV slot after the show aired, they said, you can have the footage and we got the athletes for free. I was sure. put Travis Pastrana yep. on television when he was outside of the X Games when he was 18 in the first Enduro at Erzberg. We sold them through Impact Video, which was kind of the go-to for action sports. And sure. uh, I think they were in Carlsbad. Um, Trace, I think it was Tracy Andrews was in Carlsbad, California. And those DVDs sold like crazy. It was like free money. Sure. And that was from 04 to 08, I think. And then what you're talking about, that's when the revolution of technology and everything started taking hold. And Sure. And I, I remember that when they, they posted up in the uh, peninsula in Beverly Hills, YouTube did, and just started interviewing celebrities. That's how they started. That'll they put $100 yeah, million. That, dollars. Going. Yeah, they put $100 million behind that project. And here you go today. They're huge. Yep. So it's a very, that was a very, very interesting time. But going back to the birthday and the cars, is there a lot of liability in those types of cars? And, you know, that kind of stress you out a little bit when you have some of these cars on the road? Uh, not, no more so than anything else. Everybody's got their car insurance. Um, and uh, I mean, there, there's no liability from a manufacturer standpoint about producing a car like that. So, I mean, there's always liability because somebody will sue anybody whenever anything goes wrong. But at the end of the day, I mean, everybody's got insurance that was out there. Everyone's license that was out there. And we all had a good time. And now as far as your business goes, how do you market business like this? Is it like but like marketing in a, you know, a private jet company or? Yes, it is. But it's also a lot of word of mouth, too. Um, a lot of people are like, whoa, that was all like it's, I had the great greatest time ever doing this thing. And next thing you know, like three of his buddies are coming in the next one. So it was a starting at small thing. We've tried the Google ads and everything like that. But at the end of the day, to convince somebody to spend between five and $15,000 on a, on a week's vacation driving their car is no easy task. But the guy that is willing to do that and has the money to do that will be all over it as soon as he hears that it, it's awesome. So uh, word of mouth has been a big way for us to, to grow the business our repeat customer base. I mean, we're, we're a once in a lifetime trip that these guys are doing two or three times a year. Just the repeat business is, is phenomenal. And we're like every customer we get, uh, we get doesn't do one trip. They probably do four or five trips. Where else have you been besides, you know, out West? I mean, we've been out West. We've been uh, Pacific Northwest. We've done Charleston to Miami was one we've done. We were doing DC to Nashville again in April. Uh, we've done Iceland. We've done Italy. We've done Germany. We've done Austria, Switzerland. Um, we've done uh, France. We're going back to France and Spain this time in August. Uh, over to Scotland in October. Back to Iceland in February. So, I mean, we're all over the world. Like if there's, there's good fun places to be and it's within a reasonable flight of the continental US, that's on our radar. So from an organizational standpoint, right, you putting together one of these parties, events, whatever you want to call it. How do you start? What's your first step? And, you know, how do you plan that? I mean, we plan the route. First off, we stitch the route together. That uh, that makes a lot of sense because we don't do gumball-esque driving where you're doing a thousand miles of driving in a day. Uh, we like to get to places where no stickers on the car or anything like that. So we get to places without getting pulled over. Uh, we go to these places. We enjoy the place. We enjoy the location and the destination. Instead of just like going, snapping your selfie and then bouncing out, we actually go like if we get to the Grand Canyon, we'll take helicopters down into the base of it and drink champagne and hang out there for an hour. We won't just go and be like, all right, West Rim, take a picture. All right, we're out of here. Um, we got to get to the hotel before one in the morning so we can get to the nightclub tonight and party till seven, then wake up at eight and do it all over again. We don't do any of that. So so is this is somewhat of a creative experience from from you, right? I mean, if you're a film guy, yeah. start making DVDs, you, you're a little bit of creative, like kind of painting your picture. It is. It is. Most of it is. In, I do all the logistics. So it's a lot of an expression of things that I like and I enjoy. And luckily, other people enjoy stuff that I enjoy. And it's not the 
like I, I get bored very easily. So going to the world's largest rocking chair in Kansas isn't memorable to me. It's not something where we're going to go and spend some time. But virtually every day on adventure drives, we do something that people would travel from around the world to do, whether that's like drinking moonshine in Tennessee or going to the uh, Kentucky Bourbon Trail or I mean, there, there's you name it. There's areas of the country driving tail of the dragon. I mean, that's like, is that, does that road rival the uh, Furka and Grimsel Pass in Switzerland? No, not at all. But is it something that people regionally and, and even all across the country talk about as a fabled road that you have to drive? Yes. So we, we throw it on the list. Um, staying at the Greenbrier in West Virginia uh, or, or going around DC, staying at the Mandarin Oriental, who's one of our hotel partners. Uh, we have a whiskey sponsor, Whistlepig sponsors us for the events. Um, we were up at the Whistlepig Distillery up in the Northeast uh, on the fall drive. Went to Cliff House in Maine, which is a phenomenal property right on the coast of Maine. <laughs> And all of this stuff is like really memorable, really upscale. Everything's included. Uh, it just makes for a very, very relaxing experience. I mean, going over to Europe, a lot of people are concerned about the language barrier. We make it so seamless that you're checked into your room, your luggage is in your room. You show up, you don't have to go wait in line at the hotel. Everything just works very, very seamlessly to make a nice luxury experience where people don't feel um uncomfortable in any way, shape or form. They just feel like they belong there and they don't have to think and they could just throw their feet up and enjoy themselves. Well, it's kind of like you're a celebrity going to do a show at a casino. <laughs> Essentially, yes. It, it's funny because a lot of people come on the trips because I, I put the ads for the trips at the end of my videos. So a lot of the people are coming on the trips because of me and they want to hang out with me. So that from an organizational standpoint is it, we, we had to cross something with the, like my other business partner and my, um, and my staff is like, you can't expect Rob to do as much as you would want as an employee because Rob has to go entertain everybody. So uh, I, I'm there. I, I'm there having drinks with everybody and going and doing fun stuff where they're behind the scenes working and, and doing everything that I'm about to take credit for. Now, how do you how do you handle the drinking? Usually one glass in each hand. <laughs> Because anymore, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I, I drink and I drink the mezcal or whatever. But sometimes if I get past that fourth drink, that fifth drink, my head is not 100% the next oh, day. I don't, I don't drink that much. I, I drink good stuff and I drink in moderation. So I can drink gotcha. every night. Um, three drinks, I would say, is my max. Three drinks, nice. I feel like I'll, I'll like not room spinning, but three drinks is enough for me to go to bed and like pass out. And be um, and wake up tomorrow and function. Yeah. And yeah, wake up in the morning and, and function perfectly fine. Uh, two drinks, I can go read a book before bed. So now, now family, married yep. kids, married two kids. Yep. How old are your kids? Uh, they're going to be nine and five in a month. Nice. And so. how, how they've, how have they been through the pandemic? I know with New Jersey being a little, yeah, he's been in school since October. Um, so that's good. A couple of like, all right, somebody got sick in the class and now you're home for 10 days. But other than that, it's been pretty seamless. And what kind of car do you drive? Uh, well, the car that I normally drive, we just shipped out to Vegas for this dude's birthday and uh, and shot it up. So that now I got to find a new one. Oh, okay. Um, the I was driving like just a thousand dollar Mercedes every day. Oh, okay. I bought it four years ago from a friend who bumped into something that the insurance said this is eleven hundred bucks to buy it. I'm like one owner, one hundred and fifty thousand miles. Throw it this way. I'll drive that thing every day. Yeah. Uh, four years later, it met its fate in, in Vegas. You are a real car guy then. Well, I mean, I don't know if that makes me a real car guy. I just, I'm a lot of car people like to wear their car as a extension of themselves or um, as an accessory to make other people think they're cool. I don't need that and I don't care. So like, I've got a lot of fun cars, Ferraris, Corvettes, Supras, uh, NSX. I've had a GT3. I've got all my rental cars, um, which are like Ferrari, Lamborghini, Bentley, uh, Maserati, McLaren. But I, I don't drive those every day. Like if it's, if there's a reason to drive it, I'll absolutely take it. But otherwise I'm not like pulling up to the valet at dinner. So they think I'm cool. I'll pull up in the thousand dollar car and then go have my dinner. Like I, for me, I'll, I, I'll own a Ferrari and, and I'll put 5,000 miles a year on it in three weeks of driving. I'll go literally ship it to Denver, put 2,000 miles on it in a week and park it for the next three months. Uh -huh. So I'm more into where I'm driving and, and the right tool for the right job than I am 
uh, driving around so everybody sees me getting groceries in a Ferrari and be like, who's that guy? That's so cool. I, I don't uh, aspire for that. I don't really do the designer clothes or anything along those lines. I just about to enjoy myself. Well, have you ever heard of um, uh, 221 in North Carolina? 221, isn't that, uh, 218 is Tale of the Dragon, isn't it? That uh, I'm not sure about 218, but 221, Asheville, Lake yep, Lure. Okay, yeah, so that, that's all in the same sort of area. Oh, okay. Yeah, I we have a house on Lake Lure, and I've, I was always told that 221 was one of the top 10 driving roads in America. Is that sure. still the case? I mean, they, they said the Blue Ridge Parkway. I mean, everybody loves to brag about like their local road as being one of the top roads to drive. They, they say the drive, and I don't know, have you been to Florida down the one going down to Key West? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, that's to me, it's, it's all right, but it's like, I can't think of that as like a must drive road. Mm-hmm. And they, they've got that as one of the top drives in the country. And I was like, that's pretty boring. Even the PCH going from like Malibu up to Napa or up to um, San Francisco. Francisco, I don't think is that phenomenal. Uh Uh, A lot of it is inland a little bit. So you don't even see the ocean. You get little speckles of, of greatness, but it's not, not really the best road to drive. It takes like eight hours to drive the damn thing. And you, you got the cat skills by you. You ever done any? Yeah. I mean, again, I've been through all these places and yeah, you get a little bit of, of nice road, but once you've experienced like proper roads and I'm talking about like remote roads, not cars coming in every direction, uh, outside of, uh, Yosemite and in California, there's a road called, I think it's like Brennan Pass or something like that. And you come into that from uh, Nevada and that's, that's probably one of the best roads in the country that nobody knows about, but it's just, I mean, there's, there's elevation changes. There's the little dippity doos in the road and then there's the banking and, and you got the mountains all around you and it just, nobody's around. And it's a great time uh, leading into Mammoth and it connects you right over to Mammoth, which is a big ski area and you're coming in from the East. So like, that's a great road. And nobody knows mm-hmm. about it, but it's people love to brag about the well-known ones or the ones that are cool. Northern Italy's Stelvio Pass was on Top Gear. So everyone talks about Stelvio Pass. It's like one of the worst uh, mountain passes to drive in the Alps. It, it's, yeah, it's dramatic to look at in a photo, but like Furka, Grimsel, Suston Pass, all much better roads to drive and there's never anyone there. Well, you were somewhat on the, on the edge with content, with your business. So now we're looking at today, 2021. What is, do you see anything you're changing um, due to technology, getting better? What does that look like the next six months, year for you? Are you- Yeah, I mean, I'm just moving over to more high-end content. I mean, I mean, as, as I've been saying, I've been doing this for a while. So, I mean, when you're doing it for 20 years, you can only get kicked in the nuts so many times uh, as you age because the shtick gets old. I mean, you can't, like, just doing a burnout is great, but it was great back in 2001, two, three, four. But fast forward 20 years, if this guy's just doing burnouts every other day, all you're doing is wasting tires and doing the same thing over and over again. So I just launched a show called Sorted. It was uh, myself, Matt Farah, Amelia Hartford, and then uh, Tanner Faust, who was the one of the top gear hosts and a professional race car driver back in the day. And uh, that's a great show. And then we're moving more into that. The, uh, the, like the Netflix quality content on YouTube and who knows, maybe we'll put it on Netflix or, or resell it or rebrand it for airplane use or, or whatever we end up doing, but it's, it's proper good TV show built for, uh, for YouTube. How much content do you have recent the past five years? I mean, in the past five years, I probably do about 75 videos a year, maybe a hundred. So, mm-hmm. but I, I'm not, a, I'm not the daily vlogger. There's guys that'll do two, three videos a day and have thousands of videos. I've, I've got maybe 800, 900 videos on, on YouTube since 2006. Have you ever done anything on Facebook? No, uh, I'm just about to kick up my Facebook, Instagram TV, Snapchat, and uh, TikTok. Uh, I just had one of my fans wanted to launch a TikTok for me. And then like in six videos, I got like 3 million views in like a couple of days. So I was like, all right, we can, we can do something with this. Yeah. So I've got somebody managing all those platforms that I'm not using to gotcha. uh, recycle the content and monetize further. Well, if you want to look at something we do, I mean, we have a big social platform. Uh, we have about 40 million people. We have one of the biggest platforms, I guess, in the world on Facebook. And we just partnered with Facebook Okay. because um, Facebook's going to an MCN model. Sure. Um, and we're one of 35 companies in the world to do that. So 
maybe maybe we should talk about some content which could run it through our network because there's some definitely money to be made there. Yeah, and and what I did was I just signed with a company and they're going to be doing and what they do is they go to people with big followings and then they monetize the platform because nobody wants to do all the platforms, right? That that's a full time yeah. job in itself. So now they're going to guys with the big content providers and saying we're going to multiply all your other channels that you're not even using. I don't care about Instagram TV. I don't care about Facebook. I don't care about Snapchat or TikTok. I've never done either of them, but they're going to do it and they're going to make some money. And then they they keep a percentage, obviously, and give me the rest. So for me, it's all free money. And for them, it's free money or free content for, for which they can make money. And they know what they're doing there. And, and I just really have zero interest in, in getting involved in it. Well, how long are you locked into that deal? Uh, three years. If they do what they say they're going to do, it's three years. Oh, okay. Well, if that don't work out, keep us in mind. I will, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's what we do. We have multiple pages and we utilize, we have uh, the original content for the actual person on the page. And then we have time slots where we fill in and then we cross post through the 40 million or whatever. And with this with this thing, potentially we can end up having about 10,000 creators under our belt. Okay. So then you're looking at a, a pretty massive reach only you know whatever that number could be these guys did did it right they they didn't make any promises. They they tested out. They they took some of my videos to test out, and they took like a successful video, like a middle of the road video, and then a video that flopped. And then they put it up on a on a new channel, and they look at the metrics and see what the response is. And based off of that, they decide whether to a like work with you or work with you and guarantee something or not work with you at all. And they had a really good response for my stuff, so they uh, both offered to work with me and then made me a guarantee. So okay, nice. So the fact that they were able to guarantee the amount of money that they guaranteed guaranteed me and they're advancing me a good chunk of it up front means that there's probably a lot of money for them to make as well. Uh, that means their response must have been pretty solid. Rob Ferretti, uh, if y'all want to check him out, it's Gotham dreamcars.com. He's kind of like the car entrepreneur, uh, fantasy parties, um, I don't know. You want to fill that in? Tell me. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm the, the luxury road trip guy. You have a car then come on a luxury road trip. I mean, we, we do these bucket list trips and you get to see the world with a bunch of great people. Um, if you don't have a car, come rent one. I've got an exotic car rental company and then we rent out exotic cars to you. If you want to live that life for a day or a week or a weekend, uh, we do that. We do something called the dream car tour where you get to sample six different cars in one morning. Uh, we do that throughout, uh, April through October in the Northeast. And if you, don't have the money to do any of those. You just want to follow along and, and watch everything happen and learn a little bit about business and a little bit about life and, and watch us horse around in cars. You can check out my YouTube channel. That's Super Speeders Rob on YouTube. Uh, definitely check out the series Sorted. You're going to enjoy that. That was brought to you by Auto Tempest, among others. But uh, that's a great time and, and a great collaboration between uh, a bunch of big names in the automotive industry and and it made for some pretty epic content. Well, Rob, I appreciate you coming on the show. He has a very, very unique business. So go check him out. And yeah, if I'm in New Jersey, back in New Jersey, I'll look you up. Maybe we'll go have a drink. All right. Sounds good. I've got it here. All right, man. Uh, I'm John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bank Productions. 